you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. I want to talk to you tonight about your personal testimony. Your personal testimony. Every Christian has a personal testimony. If you have been saved, you have a personal testimony. And, uh, you know, while I was on vacation, uh, I read a book, and uh, it was really, really good, uh, talking about witnessing. And, uh, you know, I just got the idea uh, from the book about uh, the subject tonight. And so I want to share with you your personal testimony. Number one, God has a personal plan. God has a personal plan. Anybody need an outline? Lonnie's got them in his hand. Does everybody have an outline that wants an outline? Okay, there we go. You'll just lift your hand up real quick. We'll get them to you. God has a personal plan. Number two, man has a personal opinion. You know what I, you know what I found out about man? They share your opinion whether you want to hear it or not. Their opinion, all right? And everyone has an opinion. And an opinion is just an opinion. Number three, you have a personal testimony. You have a personal testimony. John chapter 9, verse 1, God has a personal plan. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Remember that, okay? Blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Again, the disciples are learners, uh, and a disciple is a follower of Jesus. And, you know, they had many, many questions. If you really look at the Gospels, uh, you will see that they were asking questions all the time, which there is nothing wrong with this. But with this question, there was also an assumption, okay? Who sinned, okay? And, folks, just because... Uh, something may not seem right, or maybe something bad ha happens to somebody, doesn't necessarily mean they have sinned, okay? And we'll be talking about that here in just a few minutes. This man or his parents. Uh, then Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, okay? And, and that is the right answer, okay? Some things is just life. But you know, I got to thinking about that. The bottom line in all of that is when Adam and Eve sinned, sin came into the world. Death came into the world. Sickness came into the world. And it doesn't necessarily mean God made or created this man blind. Okay? Just think about that. But that the works of God should be revealed in him. And again, folks, God has a purpose for everything that goes on in your, your life. This man just didn't happen to be on the road that Jesus was on. God had a plan. God was going to use this man mightily in the end. But the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who has sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. And folks, God's always working. Jesus was always working working. And again, I understand the ideal of being a workaholic, and I understand in some instances, in, in, you know, that's probably not a good thing. Uh, you know, a lot like when dealing with the family, okay, we need to spend time with our family. But Jesus' whole purpose, he was going to do his ministry for three and a half years. He was always working. He was always ministering. He was always teaching people, and especially the disciples. Verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So there, he really answered the question there. I, you know, Jesus knew this guy was blind. Jesus already knew what was going to happen. And he always uses a physical need. You think of feeding the 5,000, and he'll go into a biblical or a spiritual lesson, okay? So all this was for a purpose, and he had a plan for this blind man's life. Then verse 6, and when he had said these things, he sped on the ground 
and made clay with uh, uh, saliva, uh, and he anointed the man, anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, I know, uh, you know, we have people that would look at this and say, are you kidding? Let me, let me give you the modern version. He spit on the ground, okay? And I promise you, if you were that blind man, you would not complain about how Jesus did what he did, okay? And, and again, when you think of the, just the dirt part of that, folks, man was made from, from dust. You know, I mean, you know, in all that, and, and he had a purpose uh, for everything that he was doing. And he said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So Jesus gave him something specifically that he needed to do. And the question I have to ask myself was, if he didn't go, would he, would he have healed him? You know, my personal opinion is no because he was sent, but this man obeyed Jesus. Jesus, not knowing who he was, maybe having heard about Jesus, but not even seeing him, all right? So it went and he washed, and he came back seeing. Can you imagine how excited this man was? That spit and dirt that he got off his eyes, I'm telling you, he did not care one way or another. He was rejoicing. He had been, and, and again, this wasn't a young man, folks. We're not talking about a teenager here or someone in their 20s. There was an indication he was somewhere uh, around probably 35 or 40 years old, and he had been blind, and, and how excited he must have been to be, to be able to see for the first time. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen him, seen the blind, said, Is this not he who sat and begged? Why would that be a big deal to the neighbors? Because they saw him do this every day of his life. He would go somewhere close to a temple or close to a, a marketplace or a close uh, to a place where a lot of people came. Why? Because that's the way he made his living. Okay? He had to, he had to beg. Uh, you know, for money so that, uh, you know, he would have food and he would have provision. And it said, and some said, this is he, and others said, he is like him. Which, which means what? Some believed that it was he, others did not believe. And folks, that's going to be true in all of life. People could even see a miracle happen and, and they'll they still don't believe. And he said, I am he. This is his first part of his testimony. He said, I am he. I am the blind man. Verse 10, therefore they said to him, how were your eyes open? And you will see down through scripture here, four times he was asked this question. Four times, how did this happen? So the first one's what first time was with the neighbors. And he answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. <coughs> Excuse me. So right then, okay, in this part, he repeated what had happened. Okay? This is not something that he met that he made up. He was simply sharing his testimony of what happened in his life. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. Hold your finger there and go to Matthew 5. Matthew 5. And I know you know this scripture, but I think this, this fits here perfectly. Matthew 5, verse 14. Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. <clears throat> this is Jesus speaking here. This is the Sermon on the Mount. This is after the Beatitudes. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. When you look up and it's night and there's a city arise above you, <clears throat> you see that, okay? You can see it for miles and miles and miles. Even when you're on a pinnacle or a, a, a hill or a mountain of some, time, some kind, you can look out over there, okay, and you can see the city. 
And it says, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Do you think this man was, was giving out light? You think this man, this blind man, seen for the first time, was excited about what Jesus had done in his life? Do you think this man was ashamed of what Jesus had done in his life? Do you think this man might have told everyone on that road and everyone he's seen what Jesus had done in his life? And folks, you have to understand that's the same thing that happened to us when we were saved. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. Jesus made us alive. Okay, he put the Holy Spirit in us. He, he gave us eternal life. And so, uh, you know, he is the light of the world. And, and I am telling you, we should be reflectors of that light. And it says, verse 16, and here's the deal. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, his job, which he did very well, was to tell others what Jesus had done for him. And I am telling you, everyone around them knew this guy, knew that he was blind, knew that uh, within minutes his life was changed. And, and the whole purpose here is just like our salvation. Folks, it's never about us. It's about what Jesus has done for us. It's not about how dramatic your testimony is. There are a lot of people that don't have the Saul to Paul testimonies, but everyone has a testimony. And here, what he was doing, and he didn't even know he was doing it. He had only been saved possibly a few minutes, 20 or 30 minutes. But in his reactions, in what he was doing, he was letting his Light shine before men. Folks, that is God's personal plan for this man, this blind man who now could see, and that is God's personal plan for you. To do what? To let your light so shine before men, verse 16, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So this man was doing that and probably didn't even realize that was what he was doing. But we see that God had, a, God had a plan for this man, and God has a plan for us. And the second thing I want you to see, man has a personal opinion. And here's the deal, folks. Anytime there's a great movement of God, anytime there is a salvation experience, I'm telling you, Satan is going to be close behind. He does not like people getting saved he does not like people getting right with God. If it was in a revival setting, he doesn't like a church that has revival. Okay, so you must understand that it's coming. Anytime you have these mountaintop experiences, and I'm telling you, this guy was having a mountaintop experience. He had been blind his whole life, and now he could see. Look at verse 13, and they brought him who were formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Why? Because the Pharisees were the religious police. Anything that went on like that, they, the, they were the ones that were going to make the decision to see whether this was a true miracle or not. Verse 14, now it was a Sabbath. Remember that when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. That's two times. And he said, he put the clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Three times his story doesn't change. Folks, your testimony never changes. You don't just make up testimonies according to who you're talking to. Your personal testimony, when you got saved, how God saved you, and what happened never changes. And then verse 16, therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he doth not keep the Sabbath. Now here is 
the religious folks. Here is the legalist, okay? And you ask yourself a question. If Jesus came and told you what to do and you were blind, would you care whether it was the Sabbath or not? You wouldn't, okay? And what they were doing, they were, you know, sifting gnats is what they were doing. They wanted to be in control of this situation. Their whole life was to make Jesus look bad. Their whole life was to find something that was wrong with Jesus. And I'm telling you, this man would have nothing to do with this. And you'll hear that in just a minute. And, and folks, it's just like, you know, you could go back to the Old Testament when, man, if your ox is in a ditch on the Sabbath, you get your ox. Okay, no, I don't think... Yes, I believe we ought to observe the Sabbath. Yes, I don't think it's God's plan for us to work on the Sabbath. But I'm telling you, when God is moving, it doesn't matter what day of the week it is. And others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs and there was division among them? That's how I know Satan would got right in the middle of this. Why? God unites and Satan divides. It's always that way. Verse 17, and he said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. And he said, he is a prophet. Now, you know what that told me? This guy had no clue who Jesus was. Okay? He had no clue. All right? Jesus, you know, even in Old Testament, you know, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees uh, could have taught this man at one time, or he heard about there was a Messiah coming, okay? But the closest thing that he could think of is one of the prophets, one of the prophets. And there's nothing wrong with that. He just literally did not know who Jesus was. And then verse 18, but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until uh, they called the parents of him who had received his sight. What did they do? They didn't believe the man, so they thought, we'll go to plan B. Okay, maybe this guy's lying to us. Maybe this guy just thought, you know, and, and, and maybe these people just thought. They thought that before. Some of them said, well, he kind of looks like him, but I'm not sure. Well, let's talk to his parents. Okay, let's see what they say. What were they looking for? A different answer. What was they looking for? It's just anything to prove that this Jesus did not heal this man, okay? Verse 19, and they asked him, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? The third time the question is asked, Is this your son? And his parents answered then and said, We know that this is our son, and we know that he was born blind. Strike two. The Pharisees were trying their best to find some way out of this. The Pharisees were trying their best to explain this away. But even the parents, and folks, you know, parents, they know their kids, all right? They know who their children are, okay? You might disguise them. You might try to change things and, and all these kinds of things. But he said, no, this is our son. But by what means he now sees, we do not know, or who opened his eyes, we do not know. And he is of age, ask him. Which tells me again, we're not talking about, you know, a teenager. We're not talking about a 20-year-old here. All right? He is a man. If you want to know something, you ask him. And of course, that is not what uh, the Pharisees were looking for. He will speak for himself. And his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. So what were they doing to his parents? They were threatening them. They were threatening them. If you agree with this, then you are no longer welcome at church. You no longer can come to our church or our synagogue. 
And it said, therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. And I really don't believe, you know, that they were just passing the buck, okay? I think, and, and it will say here in just a minute, they did it strictly out of fear, just out of fear. Where's fear come from, folks? Fear comes from Satan. It comes from Satan. So again, they called the man who was blind, and they said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is blind. So we have seen God has a personal plan. Man has a personal opinion, and the, the opinion of the neighbors and the people were, we're just not sure. I think it's the guy. We think it's the blind man, but it may not be. But of the scribes and the Pharisees, especially the Pharisees, their opinion was there's no way this guy could have done that. Jesus could not have done that. Why? Because he healed on the Sabbath. He is breaking one of the, the, the Sabbath laws. And so we have two sides and, and two opinions here and also a threat, a threat, a threat. And so again, verse 24, let's look at you have a personal testis, testimony. So again, they called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know this man is a sinner. So what were they really saying? All right, I mean, it's his way of saying, if you are one of us, if you believe the law, if you uh, believe, you know, that, you know, what we're saying, give God the glory. Don't lie to us. Don't say what you have been saying. And he said, we know this man is a sinner. And folks, every one of us here and, and those who knew Jesus knew he was not a sinner. Folks, he was the lamb. He was the perfect lamb of God. And then verse 25 says, and he answered and said, and folks, I'm telling you, this, this, to me, this is one of the most exciting testimonies in the word of God. I'm talking Old Testament and New Testament. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, uh, now I see. Do you see there? And, in, and I wrote outside here in my Bible, boom, he let the hammer down. All right? And here's the deal, and here's what I love about a personal testimony. Nobody can refute your personal testimony. Nobody can say, that ain't true. Why? Because it's personal. It's what happened to you. Most people, if not all the people around, were not there when you were saved. They don't know what happened to you. They don't know where you were at. They didn't know what your life was before that time. And that's why, folks, I cannot tell you how important your personal testimony is. And in this book, that is the one thing that stood out. Of all the things I read, that is the one thing that stood out, and that's one thing that I am going to correct in the future. I am going to use my personal testimony more in witnessing situations. Why? Because nobody can refute that. Nobody can say, I mean, they may call you a liar, but you simply say, this is what happened in my life. Folks, you are a witness for Jesus Christ. You are a witness of what Christ has done for your life. And this guy did not care who was speaking to him. This guy did not care that he was, or his parents were threatened. He did not care. Why? Because he could see. Why? Because there was positive proof, not only something that physically changed in him, Something spiritually was fixing to change also. And folks, many times, Jesus Christ did miracles. Some physical miracles so a spiritual change may take place. Think about the woman at the well. There are several instances in the Bible, and especially in the New Testament. One thing I know, man, I don't know a whole lot. I, I don't know the laws. Okay, he would not have been allowed to be, all right, you know, uh, uh, as far as actively participating in, in the temple. Why? Because they would say he sinned. There was something 
that he had done. But yet, he knew what God had done for him. And I'm telling you, he was giving one of the best testimonies I believe that were ever given in the Word of God. Now, through these verses, verse 26, and they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And I told you, basically he says, I told you already, and you're not listening to me. The guy just got tired of it. He just said, I've told you, this is the fourth time, three of the times you heard it. And this conversation goes on down through there, and they keep talking about Jesus being a sinner. He kept telling them exactly what happened in his life. And, and again, that argument never changed. That argument, the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, it changed zero. But look at verse 35. Look down at verse 35. You have a personal testimony. And Jesus heard that he had cast him out. Basically, the scribes and the Pharisees, if this is your testimony, if you are sticking by it, if you are claiming that this is what this man done, not only will we kick your parents out, we're kicking you out of church too. <laughs> Can you imagine being kicked out of a synagogue or a church because you told the truth about what happened in your life? Folks, I'm telling you, I'm pretty sure you can find a church that will accept you, okay? Just go on down the road. There are other churches that would accept you, even though they kicked him out. And it says, and when Jesus heard that he had been cast out, and, we had, and when he had found him, okay, what did Jesus do? He went looking for him. Why? Because he knew what had happened. He knew what had, what had happened. Because see, I mean, Satan jumps all over that. Satan wants to defeat us. Satan wants us living in fear. See, one of the things about the, the, the apostles and the disciples in the early church, one thing, if you'll read carefully the Gospels, there's a word that just keeps up, keeps coming, and keeps circulating in that time. And you know what it was? They were bold witnesses for our Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, we have become so timid about sharing the gospel. We are so afraid of, of, you know, hurting somebody's feelings. And again, I don't think you ought to go in blazing and hitting them over the head. And the first sentence is, you know, if you don't know Christ, you're going to die and go to hell. All right? That's not what I'm talking about. I do believe in relational re relationships that turn into evangelism uh, chances and, and uh, you know, presentation. But I'm telling you, Satan wants us to live in fear so that it will seal our lips to where we don't share our personal testimony with anyone, with anyone. So Jesus personally went and looked for him. And when he found him, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? Simple question, do you believe? What do you have to do to be saved? You have to believe, folks. You have to believe that he is the Son of God, that Jesus was the Son of God. And look at this answer. And he answered and said, who is he? What does that tell you? Folks, he had no clue who Jesus was. No clue. He was healed. He was given a testimony. He was speaking for Jesus, yet didn't know who he was. And that's the crazy thing about today, folks. We know who he is. We have, I mean, most of us probably have 12 Bibles in our house. Most of us have probably went to church for so long. I mean, you, you, you can. You, you can quote Scripture. You can do all that. But Satan wants us bound. Satan wants us to fear. And this conversation that was going on with Jesus, he asked him that. He said, who is he, Lord? that I may believe him. This guy knew, even though one of the greatest things that ever happened to him happened earlier in the day. And man, the Pharisees, man, they were, throwing, they were pouring water on his fire. They were basically calling him a liar. There was this tug of war going on, you know, uh, trying to keep him from being happy about what he had done. And the whole purpose in this thing was what was, what was fixing to happen in his personal life. And look what it says. And Jesus said unto him, 
You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. See, he had no clue who Jesus was. Why? Because he couldn't see. He couldn't see. He could hear, and he even heard the name Jesus. But he had no clue who Jesus was. But yet here, the Son of God was speaking to him and saying, Listen, buddy, I am he. I am he. Folks, I'm telling you, for you to be saved, you have to have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, the Lord. Everyone here that is saved had had, has had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, the Lord. The most effective thing, I mean one of the most effective tools that we have is our personal encounter testimony. Then he said, this man, Lord, I believe. Scott, the Roman road had not even been written yet, okay? Hadn't even been written. There were no spiritual law, spiritual law pamphlets given out. See, salvation, and I'm not trying to make it into easy believism. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm simply saying when Jesus, the Son of God, is talking to you, he he just saying, all you have to do is believe, is believe. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. See, maybe an hour earlier, maybe two hours earlier, he healed him. Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the power of God, this blind man, and he was able to see a miracle in itself. But I'm telling you, the greatest miracle that happens ever, ever, is when someone trusts in Jesus Christ alone for the salvation. Folks, that is one of the greatest days of their lives. You talk about a double whammy. You get healed from being blind, and you get saved the same day. I'm telling you, all the angels in heaven were rejoicing. And I, I just still go back to that one line, folks. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. You know, in witnessing, there are three tools, three tools that we have in witnessing that we should use every time we wit we're in a witnessing situation. Number one, it's the Word of God. Thus saith the Lord. And that's kind of cool about Jesus. He is the Word. He was the Word. Okay, He was the Word. The second thing is the Holy Spirit. Both this Holy Spirit, it takes the pressure off of us. It takes the pressure off of us. It's not our job to save people. That's God's job. Just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Let the boldness of the Holy Spirit engulf you. And just the third thing, just share the word. Share the word. Let the Holy Spirit take over and use your personal testimony. Why? Because nobody can refute your personal testimony. Father, thank you for this story, and God, thank you for the reminder. God, I just, uh, you know, part of relaxing is reading when you're on vacation. And God, I just, it, it, I started that book, and it really didn't take me long to read it because it was just a subtle reminder of how important our personal testimonies are and how important witnessing to everyone around us is. God, that's why you left us here. That's why we are not raptured out when we get saved. Because we are your personal testimony here on earth. We can tell everybody about what Jesus has done for us. So God, I pray that you would help us, us, the body of Christ, to use our testimony for your honor and for your glory. And God, I just want to remind everybody Nobody can refute your personal testimony. It's you. It's who you are. 
It's what's happened in your life. You were an eyewitness of what happened. And God, I pray that you would just put that fire and that passion in our hearts and in our lives. God, thank you for this story. It doesn't say this was a parable. God, I believe this was a true story, and I believe you put it in the Word of God for us Christians. And so, God, thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you for the reminder this day that we all have a personal testimony, and we all need to be sharing our testimony with people around us. God, we love you. We praise you. We give you the glory for anything good that happens in our lives. And God, thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving us eternal life. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins. And thank you that we are going to live with you forever and ever and ever. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.